Hello and welcome to Indian Standard Time. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan and my guest today is the Executive Director of the UN Population Fund, UNFPA, Dr. Babatunde Oshoti Mehin from Nigeria, second term Executive Director. Welcome to Rajya Sabha TV. Thank you very much. For the benefit of our uh, viewers, could you tell us a little bit about uh, the fund's activities? Uh, the UNFPA begins in the 60s. Uh, somewhat low-key start, but it's really the, the International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo, 1994, that sets a new course. Renewed emphasis on gender rights, renewed emphasis on uh, the rights of women, young, uh, of, of, of girls, uh, young people, uh, and there's been a huge uh, increase in the presence and the sort of activities of, of the Population Fund. Tell us, how do you carve out a space for yourself in the UN system? How do you avoid replicating some of the work that, say, other agencies like the WHO or UNICEF uh, do. So what's Thank unique you. about your fund? Everything is unique about our fund because we are the organization to go to for the rights of girls and women. And, and when I talk about that, I talk about in the context of providing services. Um, and uh, we have representation around the world in more than 150 countries. And uh, we also ensure that we talk about things like gender-based violence, we talk about things like family planning, contraception, we talk about uh, the issues of girls' education, we talk about uh, pr protecting the rights of women and ensuring that things like uh, child marriage and female genital mutilation are the things we advocate against. So in a sense, we have that all packed on in there. And you're right. Um, we started in 1969. At that time, focusing on family planning, but in, 19, uh, in 1994, you know, there, is a there was a paradigm shift in which it was all based now on human rights and human rights agenda for women and girls, uh, uh, particularly adults and girls and young people. So th w that's where we are today. And analysts have described the shift in... Uh, the approach of your organization and indeed internationally the whole issue of population a shift from a focus on or even obsession with quantity limiting numbers to focusing on the quality of life would that, would that be a fair assessment i think it's actually a focus from demographics okay. to a focus on the individual making choices so the ability of the individual to make a choice right. and, and make a choice without coercion and and i think that's really where it has come to uh, and I believe that that's, uh, and you did talk about, you know, duplication with other UN agencies. Uh, WHO is normative. In, you know, we work with WHO in terms of establishing standards and norms. But when it comes to actual, you know, cold face activities, we are the ones who do it. And your remit includes also issues like aging, which is a question of increasing concern in India, migration. Our remit includes the population dynamics. You, looking at young people, looking at the aging population, but all that within the context of the rights of the individual. Right. So we, we for, I've just come back from a meeting of the uh, World Economic Forum in, in Indonesia, and we were talking about, there about... And you're closely involved with the demographic yeah, aspect dividend. of that. Right, that's, right. that's the point. That was the point. So trying to push that dividend and getting people to invest in young people so that we can liberate their potential. But within that context, also look at the second dividend, which has become so evident in Asia now, the, the elderly. And most of them are sprightly. They are there to, you know, they can actually do contribute. I, I say that the 70 is the new 40. And so you see a lot of people. That's a comforting thought as we get older. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very close to it. So, it's, so, so the 70 is the new 40. And, and how can we continue to harness, you know, what they bring, you know, maturity, you know, mentorship, you know, and, and all of that without actually losing out. Yeah. Just to play devil's advocate, uh, is there uh, a danger of complacency here that, that, I mean, as we've moved away from the idea of looking at population as a burden to population, especially a youthful population as a, you know, demographic, a part of a de demographic de dividend. That's quite evident, for example, in the national debate in India. Is there a sense that uh, we get carried away with this notion and that in reality uh, there are far, far few jobs out there for the young people that, that, that may be productive and that in fact uh, 
the sheer quantity or number of people is in fact a problem and, and less of a dividend? That's the exact reason for the dividend. And that's why we talk about investments in health, in education, and, and, and making sure that that young person has the skill sets to fit the market today. And, and I think, you know, that's where governments have to make the difficult budgetary choices to ensure that they can do it. But governments alone cannot do it. And I think it's governments, private sector, civil society, and in fact, the young people themselves. Uh, and I, I want to say that given what we know today, we can actually liberate many, many opportunities for young people to do things different from what they've done before. If, in fact, the Asian Tigers did it, and they did it in that sense, you know, right. making sure that small and medium-sized enterprises, you know, PPPs and all of that work for them. I think that's what, that's what we're talking about. Right. So it is not about being complacent. It's about ensuring that we can liberate those energies for it to work, not only for the nation state, because now we're actually moving away from those nation state sovereignty kind of situation. We're talking about how young people can be available to meet the needs of, of the world as we speak. Now, and I just want to give uh, an example, you know, uh, in the 60s and the 70s, there were actual bets taken on India that it will implode, that the population will be so large right. that, you know, it would not be able to sustain yeah. itself. But that's not what has happened. Exactly. What has happened is that India stepped up, produced more food, you know, and all of that. Fertility, fertility rates have come down. Have come yeah. down. So, so in a sense, you know, that, that's what has happened. So... Public policy is important for that. And I think it's, it's important, you just said it, fertility rates must come down. So when we talk of the demographic dividend, we're also talking about access to contraception uh, so that, you know, uh, kids who have come from families of six or seven would make the choices to, make, to have two or have three, those that they can look after and those that they can, they can afford. Right. It's been uh, 20 years since the Cairo conference, uh, a conference that we all recognize as paradigm shifting. To what extent do you think the, uh, what would you consider the main accomplishments of that in landmark international conference on population and development? Has it really succeeded in changing the way governments around the world look at the rights of their people, at the whole question of population dynamics and demography, or is there still a huge battle to be fought? I think it has. It has moved considerably. I mean, of course, we still have a lot of grounds to cover. But, but you know, Sid, let me also say this. I don't want us to look at it in isolation. I think there were three conferences around the same period that complement each other. That was the Vienna Conference on Human Rights. There was uh, the uh, ICPD in Cairo. Then there was the Beijing Conference on Women, on Women Issues. So the three of them, you know, come together. And and I think we've seen considerable progress. For an example, maternal mortality has decreased by 50% around the world. We have seen more women in workplaces, more women in education. We have seen, you know, more policies being put in place to ensure that rights of women and girls are protected around the world. We've also, also seen more women in politics. Right. Uh, and and so, so I think we've done quite well. But there are still places and things that we need to look after. Gender-based violence, you know, is a major issue. Uh, there are still parts of the world where girls don't go to school. We still have, you know, teen pregnancies and early marriages as an issue in many parts of the world. So, so our job is not done. Mm -hmm. I've been struck by the emphasis in uh, a lot of the UNFPA literature of, in recent years on this question of dignity. Uh, your own speech to uh, the Population Foundation, even the J.R. Tata mm -hmm. Memorial Oration, you know, focuses on the question of dignity. Why is this so important? What does this mean for you? The dignity of the human person is what drives the human person. And I think that for all too long, we have not looked after dignity. And I think uh, the ability of the human person to have confidence in, within a social structure. So we're going beyond, we're looking at something beyond rights in a narrow sense. Well, it is the fact of rights and protection of rights that leads to dignity. Right. You know, if, if your rights are abused every day, then you cannot have dignity. Right. There's been some uh, disappointment uh, among people who work in this field that the sustainable development goals don't seem to prioritize 
uh, reproductive health, the rights of young people uh, to the extent to which they ought to. Uh, given the fact that many of the, uh, many countries have failed to meet uh, the Millennium Development Goals uh, targets for fundamental indicators like uh, maternal mortality. Uh, you know, is there is there a danger that the international community is losing interest or somehow its interest is flagging in this important question? No, I, I don't think so. I think what has happened and what is happening and what will happen is that there are too many things competing for space. If, uh, let's step back in, in 1999, 1999 20, 2000, we had a situation where we're constructing pro-poor policies around the MDGs. And it was a unidirectional thing. So the rich of the world were trying to provide resources to alleviate poverty in the poor of the world. And that was what we did. So those eight goals actually spoke to those. Now, today, uh, we have 17 goals. And we have 17 goals. And we have 169 targets. So in a sense, we have gone from those to now universal goals. And we're talking now about things like uh, you know, climate change. We're talking about you know, governance and all of that, which were not there before. Right. So the competition for space and the competition for, uh, for prominence is actually something which we all have to fight for. But, but, I, the centrality but, but, but I think everybody within this 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 frame actually accepts that we have not met the MDGs. And so they, there's a rollover of the MDGs and those that are met into this, 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 this space. And I want to say that we have a mention within it of uh, maternal mortality reduction. We have a mention within it of the rights of women and girls and the rights of young people. So it's there. Right. Uh, it's, just, it's just that as we go forward, right. we have to work to ensure that we have indicators right. that enable us to go on and continue to do what we're doing. Right. Uh, the current government in India has uh, tried to make renewed emphasis on the rights of women and girls. Uh, the, prime, you know, the Prime Minister coined the slogan of Beti Bachao, Desh Bachao, you know, save your daughters, you know, essentially uh, speaking out against um, you know, infanticide and sex selection and this sort of very regressive practices. Uh, but maternal mortality continues to be a problem here as in many countries. Now, as UNFPA, you obviously uh, have an insight. You look at the experience and outcomes in many, many countries. Uh, we, see, we see that some countries that are poorer than others that still do better than richer countries. Uh, can we distill a set of factors that are important in bringing down this vital indicator, the number of uh, uh, deaths per 100,000 live births, the MMR? Mm -hmm. What works? What works, I can tell you, three things. The first is human resources for health. We have to be close to where the pregnant women are. Right. And we have to be motivated. And invariably, there have to be public resources, in a sense. It doesn't have to okay. be all, but uh, it has to be inspired by public resources. Right. So that for us, first. the second, of course, is making sure that you have a supply chain systems that deliver all of what you require at the point of service. The final point is affordability. That is that every person who requires services will be able to go there without, you know, thinking about how am I going to pay for it. If you have those three and you have accountability around them, because there has to be accountability, you, you actually do have uh, a reduction in maternal mortality because we know what to do when, when it does happen. Right. And, I, and I, can, I can think about several countries in the world that are really very poor that have put this into place and it, they're making huge differences in the maternal so, so, so why, I mean, if the lessons are clear, why is this so difficult to replicate? Well, I think that... Is it a question of, public, of political will, public investments? Political will, public investments, but also the complexity of the politics of countries. You know, I mean, I, I know for an example of a country where we had a central command system before, which, in which we can work with, and they actually enable us to go to every part through them. But then they went, de they decentralized. And was, the moment they decentralized, it became very difficult. So you now had to deal with central government, sub-regional government, local government, and, and it became difficult. And you now had to ensure that the political will that's expressed at the top actually tracks down 
all the way to to the local level. And I, I, that you cannot guarantee in many places. Uh, Dr. Shoti Mahin, violence against women is a serious issue, as you know, uh, in India, around the world. But you know, since we're talking in Delhi, let's focus on India. And the you know, situation is not helped by regressive social attitudes. Uh, people, or it's not, it's not uncommon to come across, you know, uh, people justifying or making excuses for this violence. Uh, recently, uh, the UNFPA and perhaps your local office has been involved in, in uh, providing support, I think, uh, for the radio transmission of a very popular uh, television program, Mai Kuch Bhi Kar Sakti Hu, I Can Do Anything, a sort of woman-oriented uh, program aimed at instilling sort of a more positive attitude towards gender rights. Uh, how important do you think this kind of uh, communication for change can be in societies like India or other countries in the world, or uh, education entertainment? Is this something that you see uh, as a potential tool for, uh, for bringing about changes in, in societal attitudes? Yes, I, I totally believe that. But, but let me step back, because see, violence against women is, is, uh, is rooted and framed within the way we, this, we, we value the status of our women. And, and I think that's not... It's not just in this country, it is also everywhere. And, and I've seen violence in, in, in various forms around the world. And, and let me say, let me say that I even, did, I even frame it in a larger context than what we're talking about. So it's not just about the beat up or the rape and all of that. I think also, actually, our ability not to provide services for women who are going to have children and who die in pregnancy is violence against them. You know, they are, are giving away our daughters at the age of 10, right. at the age of 9 is violence against them. Right. You know, the female genital mutilation that occurs is violence against them. You know, the, 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 the sex selection process is also violence against women. So I, I think we have to look at this in that larger context. But having said that, I, I'm, 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 I'm happy and I applaud the process today that the international community and national systems have come to understand that gender parity is a must if we are going to make if we are going to actually have inclusive growth around the world and we're going to have social systems that respect the rights of everybody. And I, and I, and I, I think that that's really why UNFPA works with everybody, including uh, the Indian civil society organizations to be able to push One this. of the obstacles that we encounter uh, when we have discussions on this uh, issue of violence against women, and I appreciate your point that violence is multifaceted, maybe sexual violence, but also uh, not paying attention to issues like uh, reproductive health, maternal mortality. Mm -hmm. One of the problems we face is the regressive attitude of leaders maybe police officials, maybe politicians, who in the face of a crime would end up saying something horrible. Uh, we recently had a member of parliament exhorting Hindu women to have four children so that Hindus, somehow there's a sort of sense, misplaced sense of demographic insecurity. I don't expect you as a UN official to comment on internal politics, but uh, in your work, how, how common is, do, how often do you encounter uh, among thought leaders or you know, you know, social leaders this kind of, uh, attitude. I mean, do you find yourself battling regressive attitudes even at the top and not just uh, at, at the societal level? Very often. Uh, what I say all the time is that... So it's reassuring to know we're not unique at least. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I, what I say all the time is that sometimes they're, they're talking, they're not talking to you, they're talking to a different audience, right. even though they're making, exactly. you know, they, they're talking about these things. Because uh, politicians hold constituencies and so they send messages to get them to understand that look i'm protecting your interest and, and a pass and an informal note they often accept that you know i have to do this uh, because you know elections are coming and all that i think that my charge to politicians is that we have to be statesmen we have to go beyond that and look at you know how do we build societies that are going to be resilient and that would respect the rights of each individual. Just to shift uh, focus for a second elsewhere, uh, conflicts such as what we see in Yemen now or Syria uh, obviously pose a huge challenge uh, for, for women 
uh, for issues of reprodu reproductive health, getting access to proper medical care when you're a displaced person or a refugee becomes problematic. How easy is it for uh, UNFPA to operate uh, in these kinds of crisis situations? Uh, are you able to intervene and have an effective presence or is it uh, something that's very difficult to accomplish? Now, UNFPA has a unique role in those kinds of play situations. Now, it goes back to what you talked about, the issues of dignity. Now, we, you know, before, you know, the uh, humanitarian uh, community did not place a lot of emphasis on this. But, you know, every conflict has pregnant women. Every conflict has women and girls, you know, in an insecure space. So we are the ones who step in to make sure that we look after pregnant women, their, 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 their needs. We also ensure that, that uh, what, what women need to keep sanitation, what they need to keep their dignity, right. would provide it. And then we also provide safe spaces for them so that they are not violated you know, in terms of the things. We know that in violence and in conflict, beyond that, in, in, in disaster situations, so right. you have a, a cyclone or, tsunami, or tsunami, tsunami. Yeah. you know, when that happens, you know, gender-based violence goes up. Exactly. And so we, we, we step in to make sure that we protect them. Right. We're sort of running out of time, but she run out of time. But I, I did want to ask you a final question, uh, ask you to take your hat off as a UN official for a minute. And, yeah, that, that's uh, very difficult. Because yeah. <laughs> but but you, you were in, in an earlier uh, avatar. You were the health minister of Nigeria, uh, Africa's most populous country, uh, a country which shares many attributes with, uh, with our own in India. Uh, are there lessons to be learned uh, on the health front, uh, on the administrative front? Uh, and what, you know, what could those lessons be between a country like Nigeria and India? You know, federal, is, federal countries like Nigeria, India, Brazil, uh, pose the situation of, of uh, the heterogeneity of responses now, of also the issues of access to wealth and, and poverty things that you see. So when I was health minister, one of the things I had to do was to actually drill down and work in a unique way with state departments so that we can, and, and, and the Nigerian situation, you know, it's such that states have autonomy to do what they have right. to do. So we, we had to sit with them and say, you know what, we want to reduce maternal mortality, but you have to do it within your state and make sure it works uh, well. So it, it is about understanding, it's about assistance, it's about building confidence in them to, to make sure that it works. And, and you can't hold them because there's no legal structure to to enable you to do that, but but I think you know those were some of the things I learned. So I'm a proud Nigerian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Babatunde Oshotunmahin, thank you very much for thank joining us on Rajya Sabha TV. It's much. been a real pleasure. Uh, viewers, do keep watching Rajya Sabha TV, and of course join us next week. Another program, another guest. Keep watching. Thank you. <laughs>